Um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm relatively new to Zoom. I'm sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> um, my name is Declan. Um, I'm the author of uh, two books, as Deirdre said, and we're here today just to talk about my second book, um, Spirit of the River. Some of you may have read my first one, um, which was published several years ago, and it was about woodpeckers. And I suppose when I wrote the first book, there wasn't, I hadn't the idea straight away of writing a second book. And what we're going to just talk about today is not so much the story, but how the book came about, a little bit what's in the book and the process maybe of the writing it. And if anybody's specific questions, as Deirdre said, we could do that at the end. So I suppose when I finished the first book, um, I did have a bit of material left over, which very much I wanted to see being used. So I did have the idea that I would, there was a few bits I might do something with it. Um, the first book, um, The Forward, was written by John Borman, um, another Wicklow resident, well-known film director. And John came up with the idea, I explained that one of the things I wanted to expand more in, the, in another book, if I was to do one, was, I suppose, various themes of life, I suppose, how nature interacts with personalities, how nature and mentality and all that sort of kind of thing heals. And we ended up talking about rivers. And John was very, very fond of kingfishers. So we, I suppose, just during the course of the conversation, we kind of, kind of came up with the idea of a story involving the kingfisher and the river as a theme. And it was more, the, the river was going to be a theme to explore other birds, other aspects, because the first book was very much focused on one bird, one species, the great spotted woodpecker. And I'm not a scientist. And this was, these were very much personal observations. So it's quite a task to take on a study of a bird, like a kingfisher or something like that, and just focus on its biology. Um, it's quite intense to do that. An awful lot of that has been studied by scientists. So I very much wanted to, I suppose, take the grassroots level approach to it. So I liked the idea of the river being a theme to explore things. So I suppose that's where the idea for the, the, that book came about. I had material left. There was other ideas I wanted to explore. And in conversation with John Bourne, we came up with this idea of uh, doing that. It was actually John who came up with the, in, indirectly, I suppose, came up with the title of the book, because um, during our chat about kingfishers, he used to tell me that some of the tribes um, in other parts of the world refer to kingfishers in their country as spirit of the river, which was, I thought was a lovely uh, idea. It um, captivated my imagination. And I suppose that's where the title of that book came from. Um, while John was involved, I suppose, writing the forward of the first book, I decided to do something very different for this book. Um, I got a person to write, and you can, if you look at the screen there, you'll see the forward is written by Lily Platt. And where many of you may know of John Borman, you won't know who Lily Platt is. And this is Lily Platt here. And Lily Platt is 13 years old, and she lives in the Netherlands. And uh, so uh, naturally, a lot of people are saying, well, it's quite a surprise that a 13 year old girl was going to write the forward to your book and I, I suppose one of the things uh, growing up as someone who's interested in nature myself I said uh, for, like um, when I was a young person growing up back then being interested in nature was something was very classified quite unusual you're on the outside there was none of this environmentalism glo glo uh, global warming or any of those issues that we discuss now around when I was growing up being interested in the environment was actually put you out being a weirdo, I suppose, in some ways. Um, and I was always very conscious that when I was writing that I, I wanted anybody who followed in my footsteps, who was interested in nature growing up, didn't have to kind of feel that way. And nowadays, people are interested in the environment, the children. I, th I really wholeheartedly believe the future of the planet really now lies with the younger generation. I mean, we've seen that. We've seen the likes of Greta Thunberg and all these people who are coming forward. Their concerns need to be aired. And um, Lily is a friend of Greta's over the Netherlands. And she has started, she started about when she was nine, campaigning for the reduction of single-use plastic. And we just became friends through social media um, because she started following me. And it turned out that she knew that when I was writing the book, I was kind of on social media explaining the various birds I was watching and the rivers where it was taking place. And Lily knew the area where I was watching the birds uh, up in uh, Glendalough because her grandfather lives up there and she comes over there and she comes over to the area. And she knew the area very, very well. And she recognized an awful lot of the of things. So we got chatting about that. And her granddad lives in Avoca, County Wicklow. And uh, she goes over to see him. So I, I asked Lily to write the forward from a young person's perspective 
on the nature I was watching and also to express, uh, to give her a, an opportunity to express her concerns and her hope for the future and that. So that is, uh, was one thing that I always wanted from the start. I wanted a young person this time to do the, the forward for the second book. So um, I think she did an absolutely fantastic job. Her forward is three pages long um, and it's absolutely beautiful. I am going to be biased and say, I think it's actually the best part of the book. <laughs> but um, we leave that up to, the, to everybody to, I suppose, um, decide themselves. Now, for those interested in dogs, um, I didn't very much when I wrote this book and uh, went about do, studying my nature, uh, doing my observations, I was never alone. Um, I have a, a friend called Lucy who's here. And uh, one thing I discovered about this book, unlike the first book when I wrote it, um, the first book I had an idea, I had a plan. I sat down and wrote it from start to finish. The second one, I always feel the book wrote itself. Things changed as I went along. Birds didn't materialize where I thought they materialized. I ended up seeing other things that I hadn't expected to see and I wrote about those. Lucy, it was a very personal book this time around. Um, there was a, it was a personal journey in itself, I suppose. And Lucy was there through it. And Lucy became very much part of the uh, story, which hadn't been the plan at the time. And uh, as a result now, there's a slightly better picture of her over, over there. Lucy, I think is extremely, extremely well known, but um, that's why she's on the cover because she became such a part of the book um, that when they were designing the cover, they said it didn't make any sense just to show it as a quest by myself, a quest to look for the bird myself, uh, because Lucy was always with me. So Lucy featured on it. So that brings us, I suppose, that's the background to the book about some of the people that are involved in it, how it came about and um, where it was set. So a quest, it's called Spirit of the River, A Quest for the Kingfisher. It took place in the same area that I wrote the first book about with the, the woodpeckers. It took place in Wicklow along the banks of the Avonmore River. And this is the Avonmore River here. Um, when I was in the process of writing the first book, I used to walk along the river to get to the area I was looking for the woodpeckers and I'd watch the woodpeckers there. And while doing that, I made a lot of other observations on the way of other birds that, that I saw along the way. And when I decided to do the Kingfisher then, it was the same river. So the two stories are very, very closely interlinked. The actual location for the, for the woodpeckers is actually right beside this river here, just over to, uh, uh, just slightly off screen. Um, so the two areas, or the two species lived right beside each other. Um, that's just the way I suppose it happened. That's how the story that when I was writing the story, it wasn't that I went out to find two sort of species that were that, that were together. And um, the wood, the very wood, the woodpeckers that were in the first book, that family still had a few chapters to tell. And they're included in that second book. So they're, they're very much part of it. Because they were going to in it, as I said, I wanted to explore lots of different birds, lots of different um, aspects of nature along this river. Um, all the birds are familiar to me, but then to a lot of people, they weren't. And that's why I wanted to kind of express, show some of their lives. So the very first one that I wanted to talk to well people about naturally was the kingfisher. Um, it's a bird everybody's familiar with. They've seen it on postcards. They'll have seen it uh, in books. Many of you may even have seen it yourselves. But despite being such a vividly colored bird, a bit beautiful bright blue on one side, beautiful orange on the other side, it actually lives out an awful lot of its life unseen by people. The reason for that is the kingfishers have big territories. They're very long to, the, the, the river is only like, as we saw that they're, you know, 20, 20, 30 meters wide. So the length of the river that the a kingfisher will live on is about a kilometer and a half, two kilometers. So at any point when you go to a river, you, you, you may just see a glimpse of the kingfisher flying by and it's gone. It's gone further down the river or further up the river and you might see it again for a day or two. So you'll see little snippets of its lifestyle flying bass with a fish, sitting on a branch like this on a fish, diving and catching and gone. But the actual family life of the kingfisher, living it out, rearing the chicks like I had studied with the great spotted woodpecker, an awful lot of that goes relatively unseen and unnoticed by many bird watchers, not just myself. Um, some um, places like the Dodder have very, very well-known nesting sites where they're very, very um, easy to watch. That is the, that, 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 that's unusual. Mostly they're very well hidden. You don't see them. It goes about shrouded in secrecy. So as I started following them 
what surprised me now is like I've I've been bird watching for you know 40, 50 years. I saw my first kingfisher with my dad when I was 10. I would see kingfishers on a very regular basis across Ireland. I would see them nearly on a weekly basis because I'm familiar with the call, I'm familiar where to look with them. But as I started to write the book, I suddenly realized, despite having seen them so often, so both seeing them so regularly, I actually knew very, very little about them. So I approached the whole thing with a very open mind just to go out and see, let's track down where, the, where there's a, this pair, where the, I, as I used to go up and down to the woodpeckers, I would see a kingfisher fly past, didn't know where it was nesting. And I said, let's go and look. Let's go and try and find where this bird is nesting. And it was an awful lot more difficult than I thought. It was it took an awful lot more time than I thought. And the results, what I expected to find, as I recounted in the book, just simply weren't what I expected at all. Um, so it wasn't an easy task at all. And unlike the woodpeckers, they didn't give themselves up at all. And I suppose there was a lot less observations of the family life of the kingfisher at the end of the year than I had expected when I started off on the, the journey, I suppose, or the quest or, the, or the, the project. And that surprised me. But I did meet an awful lot of other things along the way. Um, now, that's the normal view we would see of a kingfisher that as you're walking along a river, you're just walking along, it's perched on the branch like that, dives into the water, grabs a fish, takes up and flies off and it's gone. And in a lot of the cases, that was the only um, sighting I would have for the entire day of that particular bird that you would look walk up and down that river despite being so brightly colored they go unnoticed a lot of the time and that's because they're very very small they're i suppose i can put it on the screen kingfisher actually is only about that size really really small when they're in the city again and they might look brightly colored but they sit in under branches they sit in under the air they don't sit out obvious all the time on a post and they have a very large territory so they, they go they go unnoticed a lot of the time and it took me I suppose, during the writing of the book, almost two years, I'd say, to really piece together, I won't say the whole story, but an idea of the story of the lives of the kingfishers on my local river. It took me that long. Um, they certainly didn't uh, give themselves up. One bird that also shared that river is a bird, uh, while people will know the kingfisher, a lot of people won't know what this bird is. Um, it's a bird quite unique to uh, Wicklow and only to a very small part of Wicklow. This is a duck called the goosander. This is a bird I very much wanted to bring to people's attention um, because if the kingfisher lives its lives in secrecy, the goosander really lives its lives in secrecy. And uh, we know so little about this bird's nesting habits in Ireland. There's a very small population of them and they are centered, I suppose, basically on Glen's Lock and the surrounding river valleys. There's a few pairs breeding down in, in um, Carlow and possibly one or two pairs up in Donegal. The population in Wicklow is managed and um, supervised by the National Parks and Wildlife Service because they breed in nest boxes. Their traditional nesting site is a hole in a tree, and we don't have very many trees with holes in them. Um, so the National Parks and Wildlife put up nest boxes. And all we know is basically the amount of birds we can count at one time and how many boxes are used by uh, as a nest boxes are used. That's the only indication we have of their population. This year we actually saw the, the first ducklings leave the nest. I filmed myself in one or two of the National Parks where Rangers uh, had it, uh, filmed it. We saw the chicks leave for the first time. We don't know anything about the survival rate. We know nothing about them. It's one of our most beautiful birds. Um, it's a duck and if you look at the bill, it has a very long, thin, narrow bill. It's called a saw bill. If it was to open its beak slightly, it has all these little ridges along the inside, little serrations like the edge of a saw. And that's because it feeds on fish in the fast flowing mountain rivers and the little serrations are to hold the fish when it catches it. That's the male goosander. The female goosander is very, very different. This is the female goosander. Um, very, very little, no color at all. She's just this sh shaggy crest on the back of her head. Um, they're incredibly shy. They go up to, if they see you on a, when you come around a corner on a river, they take off and they fly. And that's what you see. You just, you're walking along a river, go around the corner, next minute these two birds fly off and they're gone like that. The one thing we have learned about them is that they gather for what's known as a, in, in bird watching terms, as a lek, which is when birds gather to display on a group. 
they gather on up on the Glen. Uh, the one lake we definitely know they gather on is Glendalough Upper Lake at dawn early in the year. Shortly after dawn, they leave. They fly out of the valley. There's a picture of three of them taking off in Glendalough Lake and flying off, and they're gone. We don't know where they go. So you would go up in the morning in January, February, and there might be 25, 30 of these birds uh, on the lake. 15 minutes after you arrive, they take off and they fly off like that, and that's it. We don't know where they go, what rivers they're on, they're gone. You can't follow them. Um, we have a few nest boxes scattered around uh, with the national parks. Some of the birds nest in there. The birds um, rear the chicks, the chicks jump out of the nest box, and that's it. We don't know where they go. Um, there's a, there's a plan maybe to try and do a more in-depth study at them. For one of, for for a resident breeding bird in Wicklow, I would say that their lifestyle is probably the least documented of any of our native birds. Goose sanders are, the population we think is probably around 10, 15 pairs, and that's it. And it has, it has remained that way for about the last 40 or 50 years. It has neither increased nor decreased. Um, this is a photograph of the family when the chicks turn 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 out. I, I must add, by the way, that the photographs that these are all photographs from the book were taken by a photographer friend of mine, John Murphy. They're actually not mine, um, but he's a professional photographer who worked with me and provided his fo his photographs of the uh, for the book. And these photographs were all taken on the Avonmore River, including this one. That he's very very fortunate. He's one of the few people that actually managed to see a whole clutch of ducklings with the mother after they left. Um, they leave the nest. They go off with the mother and they just go down the rivers and we have no idea where we, where they go but we just we they just just they just seem to disappear so that's one bird that was uh, that i covered uh, in quite um a, a bit of detail uh, their lifestyle during the the writing of the book that's the goosander now one that was a lot more frequently encountered was this little chap called a dipper and dippers are very very widespread and uh, occur right across ireland but again a lot of bird people mightn't be that familiar with them because Unless you're on a river, you won't see them. They never leave the habitat of their river. And it has to be a fast flowing river. They don't go onto rivers that are slow flowing or that are very big rivers, I suppose, like the Shannon. They wouldn't be on the Shannon. They're on small streams, small mountain streams. They're quite common and where in a suitable habitat like the Avonmore River, where one territory ends, another one starts all the way down. Two years ago, we did a survey along the river and we found that as soon as we finished one territory, the next territory started, went on for about another kilometre and a half, two kilometres, and then we reached the end of that territory and another territory started and went on and on. And in some cases, 15 or 16 kilometres of river had 14 or 15 pairs of these birds all along them. So they are quite widespread, but they will never even go, they'll just go to the edge of the river, the bank, and that's it. They don't go onto trees, they don't go onto bushes, they just sit in the rocks in the river. They're a small thrush sized bird. One of their old names is called water oozel because there's a thrush called ring oozel that lives in mountains. It's very, very said that it's black, like a blackbird with a white patch across the front. This, as you can see, doesn't look quite the shape of a, of a blackbird, but it's, it, it's a similar thrush sized bird. It has very an awful lot of adaptions to living in this war in this type of environment that the short stocky shape of it is quite streamlined if you can visualize water flowing over that it wouldn't knock it over it has short rounded wings that's the reason because how this bird actually feeds is it feeds underwater but it doesn't dive in um it swims underwater it goes under, it looks for crustaceans and small insect larvae that live underneath the stones. And when it gets, it's fight, always fighting against the current. So it pulls its wings out like that and flies underwater against the stream all the time, feeding in against the, the, the gravel. And because of that, if you actually look at the picture, if you look at the legs, the legs are quite thick. You can just see where, where the water is flowing over there. They're quite thick, stout legs. It has very strong claws, very strong leg muscles again because it's always holding onto a rock against the what the, the current it's always got the water going against us it's also waterproofed as well um and so you'll always see them preening um all birds have a small little gland at the base of the tail uh with a little oil gland it's quite large in dippers because they're always preening and waterproofing their feathers because otherwise they would uh, they would soak very very quickly now what we have here on the right is a young dipper and on the left, we have an adult dipper. 
Um, so the young birds, when they come out, they nest under bridges. That's where dippers nest. And once I suppose you get into exploring any length of river, you discover very, very quickly that uh, nearly every suitable bridge will have a pair of dippers under them. They nest right in under the bridge, up against uh, the, the, under, the under surface of it. They have this lovely nest that they make uh, wedged in into a, into a crevice into it. Um, they, they lay their eggs, they have one clutch, they lay their eggs in February, March, and the young come out like this uh, in around May. And uh, the parents then carry on feeding them for about another uh, two, two months. So they, they stay together as a family unit for a, a quite, quite a long time. Um, the, if you look on the, the bird on the left on my screen, you'll see that underneath the white chin, there is a brown band. Now that brown band um, varies in, in its intensity between the male and the female. And you can, once, once you can, that's the only set difference between the sexes. But the problem is when you see one, until you've established which one is which, you don't know. You'll see one is a slightly richer one, one is a slightly better. You need to see the two side by side to actually find out which one is actually which, because the male is slightly larger than the female. So that's all part of the observation process as well of, of observing these animals and that eventually you will see the two birds in the spring together, side by side, and you'll suddenly see, ah, the male is the one that has the slightly richer uh, brown or as I say, because you can see the size difference uh, uh, in it. Another bird that we uh, that uh, I encountered along the river um, that lived in the same habitat is one that a lot of people will be familiar with, and that's the grey wagtail. And of course, grey wagtails are anything but grey. They're actually quite, quite brightly coloured, um, which causes a bit of confusion sometimes when people are going to a starting bird watching. They see these birds and they go to their bird book, they open up because there's a bird called a yellow whitetail. And these birds have an awful lot of yellow on them. But the gray is just referring to the gray on the back. The yellow wagtail is yellow under all the way underneath and a little bit on the head and back as well. The main difference, of course, is yellow wagtails don't occur in Ireland very much. They're very, they don't nest, they don't uh, breathe, they're very, very rare. The gray wagtail is our, res is our resident uh, brightly colored wagtail. They're, they occur all over um, Ireland, wherever there's suitable habitat, but along the river where I was with the dippers and the kingfishers, there was a pair of them as well. So while going about all this, while just following the lives of the kingfishers, there was an awful lot to watch, I suppose, and record at the same time. There, all of these birds were in the same area at the same time. You, you didn't just watch the one. So you would sit down to watch the, the kingfisher fishing and a grey wagtail would arrive. The kingfisher would go, the grey wagtail would stay. You see, you'd be watching the grey wagtails and you'd be documenting their life as well. And then you'd be still watching them the next minute a goosander would fly overhead and disappear that is further down the river and you're sort of saying, ah, so the goosanders are here as well. It's all part of the one story. It's the story of the river itself. Some birds got uh, revealed their secrets more than others. The, the goosander certainly uh, revealed an awful lot. So did the grey wagtails. Um, the other bird, of course, that was alongside the river was the, 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 the woodpecker itself, the great spotted woodpecker. Because as I said to you, when I finished the first book, there was some stories still left to be told. And there were quite interesting stories about the woodpeckers. Because um, the, the, the tree I had followed them in um, had been used for eight or nine years, I think, during the writing of the first book. The year after I published that book, a very strange story happened. For this, uh, for that, for, for that uh, pair of woodpeckers, that something happened to the female. We don't know what happened. She died. I was, I was following the count. Both birds were there. Excuse me. And um, I suddenly noticed there was no sign of the female. There was only the sign of the male. Now, one of the things we had done for this year, one of the things I wanted to actually do for the, I wanted to actually see inside the nest of a woodpecker, which actually hadn't been done before here in Ireland. The woodpecker has only, only colonized Ireland in recent years. We knew nothing about their survival rates. We knew nothing about um, their productivity, uh, which is the starting point. We'd see maybe that there might be two chicks would come out of a nest. Nobody knew were there only two eggs laid. So was that 100% success uh, uh, productivity? Um, with, with all birds, I mean, that's, uh, that's a, a basic thing you have to do to monitor how a species is doing its productivity is to see what the survival rate of, that, of any of the, the, the things are. But we didn't know with the woodpeckers because their nests are in a tree. So with a bit of effort, uh, we got a licenses to examine the inside of a tree and I used uh, one of these internal examination cameras and that's recounted in the book. And that, 
this on the right hand side of the screen there you can actually see the eggs taken inside and that's that's the first time the eggs had ever been seen in Ireland uh, that had been ever been a photograph taken inside a nest of a, of a woodpecker um, and we we're quite surprised to find there were six eggs so naturally when you see the eggs you know that the, the female had laid the eggs obviously but the day I took that picture the male flew out of the nest as we approached and we watched afterwards to make sure all was okay and the male returned back to the nest um, and the female never we never saw them as a female ever again after that date, we, we think she was killed, possibly by a sparrowhawk, possibly by a pine marten, or maybe just some uh, just uh, some some other uh, something ha happened to her. We don't we don't know what happened. But the amazing part of the story was that the male woodpecker from that day incubated the eggs by himself and reared the young successfully, single-handed, which is a, quite an amazing story for uh for any uh bird it's because normally woodpeckers are very loyal parents they both take part in uh, looking after the, the family they both share the incubation they both share the feeding it's not like some species like blackbirds the male blackbird guards the nest while the female does uh the incubation and then both parents would feed but the male woodpecker incubates um in this case it was quite challenging for him. And I really didn't think at the time when the book was being written, I said, this is going to be a very interesting account because we had no idea was, it going, was he going to be able to do it? Because when he wanted to go off and feed, there was nobody to come in and carry on incubating the eggs. Um, so we weren't too sure was that possible. But he did it. And uh, it's quite a fascinating aspect, I think, of, this, of the story um, that he actually went and did that. So there, we also then, I suppose for other birds now, the, the kingfishers, we weren't able to do that, unfortunately. Get, um, we, we found the nest of the kingfishers and we weren't able to get the cameras into those. We, we, um, it was just uh, too awkward, I suppose, for the, for the site to be done. All this, of course, is done under license. Um, you have to have licenses to do this. So we had licenses to do, to do to put up a photograph and to do that and to carry out these studies. But um, I suppose th the, these were the various different, I suppose, every, every species in the book did have its own uh, little contribution. So the woodpeckers contributed that, the goose anders contributed their part of it, and the kingfishers uh, contributed their part. So it's not, unlike, as I said, the first book, it's not just specifically about one species. It's about a whole habitat, really, an environment, and it's the environment of the river. And we explored the wildlife of the, when I say we, I'm always saying we, because that's the way I talk about myself and my dog, Lucy. <laughs> Actually, the, the two of us did explore it. Um, that's how I explored the, the, um, the river. Um, with that in mind was just not to focus on the one, but to get an overall feeling of how all these animals were interacting with each other on that one stretch of the river. Um, that's the natural history part of the book, I suppose. Um, it is a personal book, it is a memoir as well. The reason that came about was very much after the first book, an awful lot of my readers and an awful lot of reviewers were interested, I suppose, in certain parts of my childhood growing up and things like that, and they asked for more in, or more of that um, theme. So I included more of that. So there is, it's very much, I suppose, uh, an e in, in my uh, feeling, it's an equal balance between half natural history, half memoir. Uh, it's very much uh, my personal observations on it. Um, it was written during a difficult time. Um, and I suppose nature uh, has always been promoted, I suppose, as a, I suppose, a great way for people to re rebalance. And we've seen that during, uh, you know, the last year or two, and people have been uh, veiling, I suppose, of natural history to get through difficult times. There was that in the book as well, and I tried to kind of bring that through. So I suppose it's it's a mixture of a book. It definitely is. And um, it's it's different to the first one, for those of you that have read the first one. Um, is it a natural history or a memoir book? I suppose that's a good question. It's, it's both, I suppose. I suppose that's what it is. And really, I suppose at the end of the day, everybody would just have to decide themselves, I suppose, which it is. That, I think, is really everything I have to say, I suppose, on it for the moment. Um, I know, as Deirdre said, we will gladly take questions and have an open discussion if that's what people want to do. I'm just going to switch off the share. I hope that's we've done that right. There's Deirdre there now. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thanks a million, uh, Declan. That was brilliant. Yes. <laughs> Applause. Um, <laughs> 
we're getting a few nice uh, comments there in the chat box. What I might do now is just turn off, stop the recording so we can all just um, relax and just have a chat about